Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Patel, and today's topic of discussion is RC filters. Our objective is to examine the frequency response of passive RC filters on an introductory level. As I began the series resonance lecture, let me remind you that it is often said, never try to wrestle a pig. Not only will you get dirty, the pig will enjoy it. In the spirit, I do not intend to take the topic of RC filters to the mat, but rather strike it viciously over the head with a long-handled coal shovel and walk away. As such, this lecture will present only the most important properties of filters and will intentionally avoid any entanglement with the dirtier aspects of filters. If you are looking to get dirty, this is not the time nor the place. The idea is to present filters in a clean, focused, and direct manner and walk out of this lecture without a spot on us. Let us begin. This lecture operates under the presumption the viewer has a basic understanding of logarithms and gain expressed using the units of decibels, as illustrated in the Logarithms and Decibels lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched this lecture yet, only to really call its contents, please take the time to do so now. Additionally, just presume the viewers watched the series Resonance lecture, also available at the Big Bad Tech channel. You'll recall in the Resonance lecture, we learned that source current through a series circuit peaks at the resonant frequency, FR inside a specific bandwidth defined by the lower and upper half power frequencies F1 and F2, the circuit experiences half power or greater. If you want to think of it in this fashion, a series resonant circuit is a type of filter, specifically a band pass filter, whereby frequencies inside a particular band experience more output and frequencies outside this particular band experience less output. The behavior of a band pass filter explains the title and vice versa. Frequencies inside a specific band are passed, hence the name band pass filter. Get it? Other types of filters exist, notably band reject or band stop filters, which are almost the exact opposite of band pass filters, where a band stop filter excludes or reject frequencies inside a specific band, also defined by an F1 and F2, and they experience less output. Frequencies below F1 experience more output, as do frequencies above F2. As previously, the behavior of a band stop filter explains the title and vice versa. Frequencies inside a specified band are stopped or rejected, hence the name band stop filter. Get it? Two other common filters are known as the low pass and the high pass filter. We'll spend the rest of this lecture examining simple low pass and high pass filters. A low pass filter has one operating point, known as the critical frequency, FC. Frequencies below the critical frequency experience greater output. Frequencies above the critical frequency experience less output. As the name implies, a low pass filter allows low frequencies to pass and rejects or stops high frequencies. A high pass filter also has one operating point, also known as the critical frequency, FC, although its behavior is opposite of a low pass filter. Frequencies below the critical frequency experience less output. Frequencies above the critical frequency experience more output. As the name implies, a high pass filter rejects low frequencies and allows high frequencies to pass. Electrical filters, like oil filters, air filters, or water filters, exclude something unwanted and allow something desired to pass through. Instead of filtering out physical contaminants, electrical filters instead filter out electrical signals. Signals with certain frequencies are passed onto the output and others are rejected or stopped. This lecture will take a quick look at both the low pass and the high pass filter on an extremely introductory level. Both these filters can be easily constructed using a series combination of two passive elements, a resistor and a capacitor. A low pass filter is a resistor in series with a capacitor, and output voltage, the property of interest, will be measured across the capacitor. A high pass filter, in contrast, is a capacitor in series with a resistor, and output voltage, the property of interest, will be measured across the resistor. Yes, theoretically, one can construct low and high pass filters using inductors, but they're not because filters employing inductors don't closely match the theoretical expectations because of the internal resistance of real world inductors negatively affect their performance. Filters employing capacitors more closely match theoretical expectations. As such, we'll limit our discussion to low pass and high pass RC filters. Let's take a look at the low pass filter first. Again, a low pass filter is a resistor in series with a capacitor. An output voltage, the property of interest, will be measured across the capacitor. The critical frequency, Fc, is experienced when the magnitude of the resistive complex impedance, Zr, is equal to the magnitude of the capacitive complex impedance, Zc. If you are as mathematically competent as I expect you to be, solving for the critical frequency, given fixed component values, should be well within your reach. Again, the critical frequency, Fc, is experienced when the magnitude of the resistive complex impedance, Zr, 
equals the magnitude of the capacitive complex impedance EC. Note I've ditched the angles, because we are not concerned about angles. All we care about is impedance magnitude. I'm well aware that resistors have an impedance angle of 0 degrees and capacitors have an impedance angle of negative 90 degrees. Given fixed resistive and capacitive component values, we're being asked to solve with a critical frequency Fc, which satisfies this condition. If Zc equals 1 over 2 pi Fc and Zr equals R, we're being asked to solve for the variable Fc. If you feel you're up to the challenge, by all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Algebraic manipulation yields Fc to be equal to 1 over 2 pi Rc. You are free to use this simplified formula or to derive it on an as-needed basis via algebraic manipulation. Importantly, you should be aware that at the critical frequency, the magnitude of Zc equals the magnitude of Zr. Given this is a low-pass filter, we should expect some predictable behavior at frequencies below, at, and above the critical frequency. Consider the following series circuit consisting of a 100 ohm resistor and a 12 microfarad capacitor. The source V in has an effective value of 24 volts and an excitation frequency that can be varied from 1 to 1 kilohertz. What's the critical frequency for this particular circuit? By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. The critical frequency is achieved when the magnitude of Zr equals the magnitude of Zc. Fc equals 1 over 2 pi Rc. Substituting in our given values, we find Fc to equal approximately 132.6 Hz. Let's check our work. The complex impedance of the 100 ohm resistor at 132.6 Hz is 100 ohms at an angle of 0 degrees. At an excitation frequency of 132.6 Hz, the complex impedance of the capacitor will be 100 ohms at an angle of negative 90 degrees. At the critical frequency, the resistor and capacitor do indeed present impedances of equal magnitude. Let's now examine electrical properties within this low-pass filter circuit at the critical frequency. For a low-pass filter, our property of interest, V out, will be the voltage across the capacitor. If this is a high-pass filter, output voltage, our property of interest, will be read across the resistor. Perhaps the easiest method of solving for output voltage across the capacitor is through the use of the AC voltage divider rule. The AC voltage divider rule set up to solve for V out demonstrates that V out will be approximately 17 volts at an angle of negative 45 degrees. An application of Kirchhoff's voltage law demonstrates that the remaining 17 volts at an angle of positive 45 degrees will be dropped across the resistor. You'll note that at the critical frequency, the resistor and capacitor experience equal voltage magnitudes yet are phase shifted from one another by a relative 90 degrees. This is understandable because each element in this series circuit experiences the same current and at the critical frequency, the resistor and capacitor present identical impedance magnitudes. Voltage across each component is understandably the same magnitude. You'll note output voltage, in this case voltage across the capacitor, our property of interest at the critical frequency, is the source voltage divided by square root 2 and is phase shifted from it by 45 degrees. This is an identifiable feature of filter circuits at the critical frequency. Again, at the critical frequency, Output voltage will be equal to input voltage magnitude divided by square root 2 and will be phase shifted from it by 45 degrees. Before we move on, it's probably worth a moment of your time to copy these results or make a screenshot for later reference. Let's examine the performance of the same circuit at frequency below and above the critical frequency. As an exercise to the viewer, I invite you to solve for the voltage across the capacitor, i.e. our property of interest output voltage at 66.3 Hz and at 265.2 Hz, respectively half and twice the critical frequency. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. At the reduced excitation frequency of 66.3 Hz, the 100 ohm resistor still presents an impedance of 100 ohms at an angle of 0 degrees. At the reduced excitation frequency of 66.3 Hz, the 12 microfarad capacitor now presents an increased impedance of 200 ohms at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Capacitive impedance went up. Voltage across the capacitor should go up. An application of the AC voltage divider rule demonstrates that V out will be approximately 21.5 volts at an angle of negative 26.6 degrees. At the reduced excitation frequency of 66.3 Hz, output voltage, our property of interest, is greater than that experienced at the critical frequency. This matches our expectations of a low pass filter frequencies less than the critical frequency experience greater output. 
Let's now examine the performance of the system at a frequency greater than the critical frequency. If this truly is a low pass filter, we should expect output voltage to be less. Let's see if this is the case. At the increased excitation frequency of 265.2 Hz, the 100 ohm resistor still presents an impedance of 100 ohms at an angle of 0 degrees. At the increased excitation frequency, the 12 microfarad capacitor now presents a decreased impedance of 50 ohms at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Capacitive impedance went down. Voltage across the capacitor should also go down. An application of the AC voltage divider rule demonstrates that V-out will be approximately 10.7 volts at an angle of negative 63.4 degrees. At the increased excitation frequency, output voltage or property of interest is less than that experienced at the critical frequency. This again matches the character of a low pass filter. Frequencies greater than the critical frequency experience less output. Let's compare and contrast the performance of the system at frequencies less than, at, and at greater than the critical frequency. Granted, we've only got data for three operating conditions, but an obvious pattern should be emerging. At frequencies less than the critical frequency, the circuit experiences greater output. At the critical frequency, output voltage is input voltage over square root 2. At frequencies greater than the critical frequency, the circuit experiences less output. This is classic low pass filter behavior. Frequencies less than the critical frequency experience greater output, and frequencies greater than the critical frequency experience less output. Let's see if these observations hold true for a range of frequencies. As an exercise to the viewer, I invite you to solve for output voltage at the following reduced frequencies. 1 3rd, 1 4th, 1 5th, and 1 10th of the critical frequency, as well as the following increased frequencies. 3 times, 4 times, 5 times, and 10 times the critical frequency. Go ahead and pause the lecture and do so now. Just kidding. This is obviously a lot of tedious busy work best suited for a computer. In fact, the analysis of filter circuits is one of the rare occasions in which I find computer simulation to actually be better than a hardware lab simply because of all the tedious busy work involved. Many software based circuit simulators offer a frequency sweep or a Bode plotter where the software simulator varies excitation frequency from a user defined low to a user defined high. The simulator then plots the electrical properties of the circuit of interest for the desired frequency range. A plot of output voltage for this low pass filter might look something like this. It doesn't look as snappy and defined as when I first introduced the low pass filter. However, the results speak the truth. As we'd expect, at frequencies less than the critical frequency, right about here, the circuit experiences greater output voltage, and at frequencies greater than the critical frequency, the circuit experiences less output. This plot may seem less impressive than I initially led you to believe. Note, however, that I've plotted these results on a graph using a linear horizontal scale from 0 to 1000 Hz. This will work, however, filters often plot output on a semi-log plot where the vertical Y property, in this case output voltage, is expressed linearly and the horizontal X frequency scale is expressed logarithmically, where each equal horizontal interval represents a power of 10. The reasons for this are twofold. One, it allows a lot of data to be plotted on a smaller graph, and two, it introduces a level of math that confounds and frustrates generation after generation of first-year electrical engineering students. Adding a dubiously necessary level of mathematical complexity to the process ensures the unwashed rabble continually hold electrical technicians in high regard. Trust me, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. Plotted in this manner, output voltage as a function of frequency looks something like this. Plotted on a semi-log scale, there's now a defined roll-off that occurs at our critical frequency of 132.6 Hz, right about here. The logarithmic horizontal scale really demonstrates the snappy defined behavior of low-pass filters one might expect. Note that the vertical axis presents output voltage in units of volts from 0 to 24 volts. This is workable, but let's add another layer of dubiously necessary level of mathematical complexity to make it more confusing. There are two common methods normalized output, and gain expressed in units of decibels. Let's deal with normalized output first. One slightly more sophisticated method of presenting filter output is to normalize the output such that the source voltage, in this case 24 volts, represents peak conditions or 100% or 1, and everything else represents fractional portions of peak conditions. Anything less than 24 volt output results in normalized output of less than 1. Calculating normalized output is easy because it's output voltage over input voltage, which results in a dimensionless normalized value. 
For example, at 66.3 Hz, half the critical frequency, the output experience is roughly 21.5 volts of the available 24 volts, or 21.5 over 24 is a normalized output of roughly 0.894. This is inside the low-pass region. At 132.6 Hz, the critical frequency, the output experience is roughly 17 volts of the available 24 volts, where 17 over 24 is roughly 0.707, or 1 over square root 2, as we'd expect. Anything with a normalized output of 0.707 or greater would be considered to be inside the low-pass region of a low-pass filter. It makes sense. Finally, at 265.2 Hz, twice the critical frequency, the output experience is roughly 10.7 volts of the available 24 volts, where 10.7 over 24 is the normalized output of roughly 0.447. This is outside the low-pass region. Get it? Normalized output is a simple way of scaling the performance of a filter regardless of the input voltage. If we swapped out this 24-volt source for one with a 12-volt magnitude, one with a 30-volt magnitude, or one with a 5-kilovolt magnitude, we'd expect to observe the same normalized output at the same frequencies i.e. at 66.3 Hz, output would be roughly 89.4% of input. At the critical frequency, output would be roughly 70.7% of input. And at 265.6 Hz, output would be roughly 44.7% of input. You note a plot of normalized output looks exactly like the output voltage as a function of frequency plotted in the semi-log scale. Only now the vertical Y scale is a dimensionless constant, which peaks at 1. Moving on. A slightly more sophisticated method of expressing filter output is in terms of gain, where gain in units of decibels is 20 times the common log of output voltage magnitude over input voltage magnitude. This filter being passive in nature, i.e. a circuit without additional active sources to amplify the output, the maximum gain we could ever have is 0 decibels, where a gain of 0 decibels is a condition where output voltage equals input voltage. For example, at 66.3 Hz, half the critical frequency, this filter experiences a gain of 20 log of 21.5 over 24, or roughly negative 1 decibels, meaning output is slightly reduced, but not that much. This is inside the low-pass region. At 132.6 Hz, the critical frequency, this filter experiences a gain of 20 log of 17 over 24, or roughly negative 3 decibels. You'll recall that a gain of negative 3 decibels implies a half-power condition. This makes sense. We're at the critical frequency and should experience half power. Given this is a low pass filter, anything less than the critical frequency will experience more than half power. And anything greater than the critical frequency will experience less than half power. Finally, at 265.2 Hz, twice the critical frequency, this filter experiences a gain of 20 log of 10.7 over 24, or roughly negative 7 decibels. You may ask yourself the utility of measuring filter performance in units of decibels. Perhaps the best method is to show you. When gain in units of decibels is plotted on the vertical y-axis of a semi-log plot, it demonstrates a predictable roll-off or knee at the critical frequency, after which the slope becomes for all intents and purposes a straight line. In fact, this is one of the major reasons filter performance is measured in units of decibels. Back in the old days, you could easily approximate performance using the straight edge when the horizontal frequency scale is plotted logarithmically and the vertical gain scale uses units of decibels. In fact, there's an entire knothole I could drag you through backwards about the predictability of these types of plots, but I refuse to do so because we've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. Long story short, when plotted in this fashion, one can use straight line approximations to determine the frequency response of a filter using something called a Bode plot. If we want to think of it this way, the Bode approximations are equivalent to a generic template into which specific parameters of the circuit under inspection can be plugged and quickly analyzed without having to resort to intensive circuit analysis. If the stubborn among you are interested in wrestling this dirty, dirty pig, here's some quick guidelines. For most lower high-pass filters, you can approximate real performance using straight-line segments. Compare and contrast the actual performance in red with its straight-line segment approximations in brown. The approximated Bode plot assumes a flatline response of 0 decibels from the critical frequency over 10 to the critical frequency. From the critical frequency to 10 times the critical frequency, it then assumes a linear slope downwards from 0 decibels to negative 20 decibels. 
Given this linearity, the straight line slope intersects at negative six decibels at two times the critical frequency, right about here, and at negative 12 decibels at four times the critical frequency, right about here. These straight line segments are obviously approximations at best. However, they're not that bad. In reality, at half the critical frequency, instead of zero decibels, one might expect to observe a gain of roughly negative one decibels. You recall in our earlier example, we observed exactly that at half the critical frequency. At the critical frequency, instead of zero decibels, one might expect to observe a gain of roughly negative three decibels, and at two times the critical frequency, instead of negative six decibels, one might expect to observe a gain of roughly negative seven decibels. Again, during our earlier example problem, we observed exactly that. What's super cool about these plots is this. They're templates into which you can plug most simple passive RC filters and get usable results. Let's say you got a low pass filter that happens to have a critical frequency of 500 hertz. We are safe to assume, no calculations needed, that it will have a gain of a negative one decibels at half the critical frequency, or 250 hertz. It'll have a gain of negative three decibels at the critical frequency, or 500 hertz, and it'll have a gain of negative seven decibels at twice the critical frequency, or 1000 hertz, or one kilohertz. And finally, it'll have a gain of negative 20 decibels at 10 times the critical frequency, or five kilohertz. The suspicious among you may suspect a trap, but trust me, it really is that easy. Want to approximate a high pass filter? Simply flip the plot horizontally. From one tenth the critical frequency to the critical frequency, it assumes a linear slope from negative 20 decibels upwards to zero decibels, at which time it assumes a flat line response of zero decibels from the critical frequency to 10 times the critical frequency. On the way up, the straight line slope intersects at negative 12 decibels at the critical frequency over four, right about here, and at negative six decibels at half the critical frequency, right about here. Again, the straight line segments are obvious approximations at best. However, they're not that bad. In reality, at half the critical frequency, one might expect to observe a gain of roughly negative seven decibels instead of the approximated response of negative six decibels. At the critical frequency, one might expect to observe a gain of roughly negative three decibels instead of zero decibels. And at two times the critical frequency, one might expect to observe a gain of roughly negative one decibels instead of zero decibels. Again, it's too easy. Let's say you got a high pass filter that happens to have a critical frequency of two kilohertz. We are safe to assume, no calculations needed, that it will have a gain of negative 20 decibels at one tenth the critical frequency, or 200 hertz. It'll have a gain of negative three decibels at the critical frequency, or two kilohertz. And finally, it'll have a gain of negative one decibels at twice the critical frequency, or four kilohertz. It really is that easy. But wait, that's not all. If you're operating at frequencies extremely distant from the critical frequency and can live with a little inaccuracy, there's an even easier method to solve for gain at specific frequencies for the morbidly lazy among you. For low pass filters at frequencies much greater than the critical frequency, that's what the double greater sign means, much, much greater, where the difference between the actual plot and the straight line approximation isn't that large, we can calculate gain as negative 20 log of frequency of interest divided by the critical frequency. What's great about this lazy gain calculation method is that it does not require tedious circuit analysis. All it necessitates is the critical frequency and the frequency at which you wish to determine gain. Let's say we had a low pass filter with a critical frequency of 500 hertz and we wish to determine its gain at 1500 hertz. Doing it the laborious old fashioned way would necessitate we first calculate the impedance of the capacitor at that particular excitation frequency then use the AC voltage divider rule to determine the voltage across the capacitor. Let's say doing so results in an output voltage of 3.8 volts given 12 volt input. To determine the gain, then we'd have to take 20 log of 3.8 over 12 volts to yield a gain of roughly negative 10 decibels. This is doable and it's accurate. However, it took a number of steps to yield this value. If however we use the lazy shortcut method, all we need is the critical frequency, in this case 500 hertz, and the frequency of interest, in this case 1500 hertz, directly yields a gain of negative 9.5 decibels, super close to the actual value of negative 10 decibels, however without the necessity of hacking through a circuit analysis jungle to arrive at this result. 
This lazy gain calculation method also works for high-pass filters. For high-pass filters at frequencies much, much less than the critical frequency, where the difference between the actual plot and the straight line approximation isn't that large, we can calculate gain as positive 20 log frequency of interest divided by the critical frequency. Note the positive sign for high-pass filters differentiates this method for the similar technique employed with low-pass filters. Let's say you got a high-pass filter that happens to have a critical frequency of 2 kHz. We want to quickly approximate its gain at, let's say, one-seventh of the critical frequency. In this case, 285.7 Hz. Positive 20 log of 285 over 2000 directly yields a gain of negative 16 decibels, with the understanding that this is kind of an approximation. What's the real gain at 285.7 Hz? You'd have to hack your way through the jungle to arrive at a result only slightly more accurate at a cost of much, much more labor. Negative 16 decibels is good enough for me. Again, understand the lazy gain calculation method is only accurate for regions extremely distant from the critical frequency, i.e. deep inside the pass or stop band for a particular filter. As you get closer to the critical frequency, you got to deal with the inaccuracies of the knee or a corner, and operating a filter in this transition region may necessitate more thorough analysis to achieve suitably accurate results. If, however, you can afford slight inaccuracies, you can afford to be lazy. What's the generally accepted standard for the lazy method? It depends. Most folks confidently assume a negligible difference between the actual response and the straight line approximation at one-tenth and ten times the critical frequency. However, less stringent applications may allow you to use these approximations closer to the critical frequency. All right, that's about it for today. I know I haven't done a high-pass filter example yet. However, I'm going to leave that for another lecture since this one's getting a little lengthy. You'll be happy to know high-pass filters aren't that hard. Long story short, a high-pass filter does not take output voltage across the capacitor, but rather the resistor. At frequencies less than the critical frequency, the circuit will experience half power or less, and at frequencies greater than the critical frequency, the circuit will experience half power or greater. All analysis techniques are identical, the only difference being that plots of high-pass filters are essentially mirror images of low-pass filters. We'll examine high-pass filters by way of illustrated examples in a follow-on lecture. For the thirsty among you, yes, I have left a lot unsaid about filters and Bode plots, but as I said at the beginning of this lecture, I categorically refuse to wrestle that dirty, dirty pig. This being said, with this lecture now in your pocket, you're probably well prepared to dive into the dirtiest pig pen of your choosing and give it a go if you feel so inclined. As for me, I am done with this pig, and I'm just going to sit back and watch you get muddy. Have fun. In conclusion, this lecture examined passive RC filters on an introductory level. We learned series combinations of resistive and capacitive components experience a critical frequency when the capacitive impedance magnitude equals the resistive impedance. Additionally, we plotted the performance of RC filters on semi-log plots and calculated gain in units of decibels for various operating conditions. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.